Happy Sabbath, PMC family. I hope you are doing well. I'm happy to be with you and share with you the message this morning. Thank you very much for the beautiful music which helped us to open our hearts to the influence of the Holy Spirit. I would like to welcome each one of you and also welcome those who are following us online. I would like to thank Pastor Dwight Nelson and Brian Vordorposki for this opportunity to preach and be a channel of God's grace today. Brian encouraged me all the time during this week. For this reason, I want to thank him. He sent me text messages. He prayed with me. He prayed for me. Thank you so much. I also want to thank all the elders who prayed for me, especially my neighbors. Debbie and Jean Mitchell, thank you very much for, for your support. Today I'm happy to share with you the message that God has put into my heart. Probably not all of you know me and my family. My wife Sonia and I are PMC assistant at Elders, usually attending this uh, service. We come from uh, Italy and Spain, and we both serve Andrews University. Sonia teaches French in the International Language Department, and I teach uh, Ethics and Systematic Re Theology in the Religion Department. We have two children, Flavia and Marco, who attend respectively Andrews University and Andrews Academy. Sonia will help me uh, toward the end of the sermon by telling us a story, a story for children. So children, today you have a double portion of stories, so please be attentive. I will call you out when is the moment, but also a beautiful story for us adults. Last Sabbath, our head elder, Brian, encouraged us through Psalm 121. He reminded us that our help comes from the Lord. He is the shade on our right hand. God wants to protect us and encourage, encourage us. And this is the theme binding both sermons together. So today we will see that this protection is experienced through humility, which is the condition to live under God's mighty hand. You see here the beautiful image that Brittany um, actually made for us today. The Lord says, the meek will inherit the, the land and enjoy peace and prosperity. Psalm 37, 11. This is the text of the Old Testament that Jesus used to formulate one of his most, most beautiful beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. He says in that beatitude, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Matthew 5, 5. It is interesting to note how in this beatitude, being meek, humble, and submissive to God seems to be a necessary condition to inherit the earth that God wants to give us. Jesus adds later on in the same Gospel of Matthew, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Matthew 11, 29. The invitation of Jesus to be meek and humble like him clashes tremendously with the values of our society where arrogance, selfishness, and pride are characteristics promoted by communities whose ideological agenda has nothing or little to do with the principles of the kingdom of God. For many of us, being humble seems to be a weak virtue, which is neither appreciated nor required in our society. In fact, meekness and humility are not perceived as virtues that lead us to success in our life. In our society's eyes, like in the Greek society at the time of Jesus and Peter, humility is considered a weakness, only good for losers. 
I'm not trying to blame anyone. I'm just observing what is happening in our Western society. The questions that I have in mind for myself and I would like to share with all of you this morning are, are we sure that as disciples of Jesus, we have understood the meaning of humility? As we await the second coming, are we living, in faith, are we living our faith in humility and meekness? Sometimes it seems to me that I forget the humility that should, be dis should distinguish the follower of Jesus. On the one hand, I see that in spite of my scriptural knowledge and certainty of my beliefs, I experience anxiety on matter of health, money, relationships, work, and etc., and etc. It is my understanding that these preoccupations are affecting all of us and our families. On the other hand, I see the promise of Jesus that we just read and we want to reread. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So he invites us to learn from him since he is gentle and humble in heart. If only we could take Jesus' yoke upon us, we could find rest for our souls. Among the many activities I've practiced in my life, sports are probably the most recurrent. When I was a teenager, I practiced a lot of sports. Actually, I think I was born in a family who practiced a lot of sports. My parents both were runners, and by the age of four, they pushed me to run with them. So I did. I think when I was four and a half, I ran a kind of 15 kilometers uh, run. I probably didn't run, I walked, but <laughs> I ran some of that. And uh, I remember that practicing all of those sports, okay, I started with running, then I switched to soccer and volleyball, etc., etc. Uh, in practicing sports, I learned a lot of uh, good things. Actually, sports shaped my behavior, my character. I remember that discipline, perseverance, concentration, strive to reach the end goal, and teamwork are among the most beautiful virtues that I could experience. Nevertheless, one of the most challenging and difficult virtues to practice was, and still is, humility. I'm still a work in progress. Too often, boasting, pride, and arrogance always, have always been common to athletes. And you can see that in everyday life. Unfortunately, I can, by experience, I can say that a victory can be easily lost in a game just because of the rising pride we have about ourselves compared to the rest of the competitors. But pride and arrogance are also shown in everyday life, not just in sports. In fact, in our Western society, our society is impregnated by these unfortunate values. Since the glass classical Greek philosophers, the virtue of humility is perceived as a negative for politics, business, and society. Our Western society has empowered us to the point that we no longer need help. We are totally self-sufficient, self-support, self-determining. And we are very proud to say, I am a self-made man, or I am a self-made woman. Nevertheless, I see that in the last 20 years, all our certainties have been challenged security, prosperity, freedom, and health, to cite some of them, are under attack. You remember in 2001, we had the terroristic attack. 2009, the financial crisis started. 2020, we were into the pandemic health crisis. And now it seems that we are in a climate crisis 
with ecological catastrophes that are happening more and more, without forgetting that we are always under war on this planet. This produces an increase of anxiety and stress in us. Thus, for example, during the pandemic, I asked myself, Davide, if you are with Jesus, why do you worry so much? We live in a society that has given us the idea that we are able to solve all our problems, which has taught us to be in charge of all details of our lives and be able to dominate the situation at all times. Nevertheless, now with these last events, we are no, we no longer feel, feel in control. This is probably the source of our worries and concerns. Brian, in last Sabbath sermon, told us that Jesus is the shade on our right hand, protecting us. The question is today, how should I live with faith in God while I'm facing unfortunate circumstances? I would like to invite you to reread the beautiful text of 1 Peter 6, 5, 6 to 7, which gave me a personal relief. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may raise you up at the right time and put all your worries on him because he cares for you. Peter uses two imperatives when addressing the believers. Humble yourselves and put all your worries upon him or on him. He relates humility to anxiety. In the parable of the sower, Jesus taught us that anxiety about life is one of the major problems that might choke out God's words in our hearts. To understand this relationship between humility and anxiety, we need to pay attention to the content of the epistle. Peter talks about the suffering of God's people, but also God's consolation provided to the believers. The suffering of the believers is a reality, as it is a reality among us today. They experienced suffering in the new life in Christ, chapter 1, suffering caused by injustice, chapter 2, sufferings for doing the good, chapter 3. Peters invite them to rejoice in the experience of Christ's sufferings and to the point that they are considered blessed when offended in Christ's name because the Spirit of God rests upon them, chapter 4. Then we arrive to our chapter where we, fi where we find our text. And here Peter addresses the elders of the church to give an example of life. He tells them to shepherd the flock of God not out of obligation, but, but volunt voluntarily. Not out of personal interest, but to serve the church. Not by domination, but being an example. Then he addresses the younger one, inviting them to submit to the elders. Finally, he invites both groups to mutually submit one another and humble themselves because God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Between the two groups, Peter puts the emphasis on verse 4, which are going to read it. And then the chief shepherd appears. You will receive the incorruptible crown of glory. So it is interesting that Peter... <clears throat> suggests that we should not forget the hope in Christ's second coming while we are in a mutual submission to one another and while we are facing suffering. Then Peter relates humility and anxiety. So the first reaction I had when I read the text was, wow, 
Peter talks to a congregation like ours, a PMC congregation made of believers, of converts. And then he says, humble yourselves. He's not talking, <coughs> Peter is not talking to a, a secular society which doesn't appreciate at all the virtue of humility. So the question I ask myself, am I proud? Am I arrogant? In which way am I proud? <coughs> what, does, what, what does Peter mean when he says, humble yourselves? So first of all, Peter means that humility is a mutual voluntary submission in a relationship, in our relationships, in a horizontal dimension. So this means that our relationship should uh, be humble and we should listen to each other. And this is important to understand the second point. The second point is that humility is a, a voluntary submission to God in a vertical dimension. The two dimensions are connected. They cannot be disconnected. So the search for humility makes us acknowledge our own limitations with the consequent search for God. In other words, it's because we humble ourselves that we open to God to receive His word and His action in us. In the Old Testament, the most frequent meaning of humility is connected to the confession of faith in Yahweh. God is the one who resists the proud and chooses and redeems the humble. The question would be, in what way to humble is a confession of faith? So humility becomes a confession of faith when there is acceptance of our humble situation and contingency. This makes us surrender to God's actions with hope, despite the fact that events have humiliated and humbled us in different ways we decide to continue trusting in God. In the Gospels, Christ shows solidarity to those who are oppressed by unfortunate circumstances and who are willing to respond to Him with faith and humility. The result of this dynamic, of this relationship between Jesus and the people that were at the time with Him, is the rest and the refreshment of their souls. So humility is therefore a lifestyle. And probably you remember the, the example of John the Baptist, who acknowledged that Jesus must become greater and he, John, must become less. John 3.30. Or, for example, when the Lord tells Paul, my grace is sufficient because my power is perfected in weakness, he is inviting him to humility. Jesus also warns the Pharisees in many ways, in many occasions, because they exalt themselves rather than humble themselves. In the Gospels, to humble oneself is the preparatory act to receive the kingdom of God in our hearts. This is why to humble, to humble oneself affirm our willingness to wait for the second coming. But most likely, Peter's readers, beside all, all of this meaning that we have tried to uh, say, are also experiencing a degree of humiliation that might push them to a kind of retaliation. We all have a sense for justice, isn't it? As soon as we receive an injustice, we want to react. We want to say, hey, no, this is not right. We cannot do that. And we try to fight for that justice. The human desire of fighting back to defend our rights is strong. But to be humble, for Peter, means also to acknowledge 
that vengeance is not ours, and he, but he is, the, is God's. The point is how we respond to difficulties and hardship. The command to humble oneself under God's mighty hand is a command to accept that God is in charge in spite of the difficult circumstances. To humble ourselves is to recognize that we depend on God solely and that we are not in control of our lives. Only in this way, the kingdom of God can penetrate our hearts. Only in this way we can look forward toward the second coming with faith and peace in our hearts. The real question that I should ask myself is, am I capable of not being in control of my life? Am I willing to depend on God? Am I willing to let Him lead, lead in spite of all the problems I'm experiencing right now? But what does it mean to humble oneself? So we said, first of all, to humble oneself is the acknowledgement of our limits. The Lord today invites us not to think that we have the power to solve our problems. The power is not in us. The power is in Him. And through Him, we get all the benefits. We are not in charge of our lives. We are not in control of the events. Thinking that we can solve all our anxieties by ourselves, it's an act of presumption and pride. To humble oneself is to know how to walk with God, just as Enoch did. To walk faster or slower than God is our problem. The patience to wait for an answer during God's silences, His humility. The willingness to move forward following His initiatives, His humility. The listening to His admonition and the willingness to go back from the evil path that we're following is also humility. If we wait for God's times, his initiatives, his actions with humility and submission, he will give us rest. He will give rest to our souls and will make us victorious in due time. So facing a financial crisis to humble oneself is not to put hope in our bank account. Even I think if you have a good one, it's good. And I know that Jennifer has one. She just told us. <clears throat> Facing an injustice to humble ourselves is not to retaliate. If not, we are just like our oppressors, but rather to wait for God's intervention who will give us our right back, but in due time. Not now, probably. To humble oneself means whatever happens, I'm going to have confidence that God is ultimately in control and will take care of me. To surrender to God and depend on Him daily, <clears throat> on His daily intervention with peace, is not an easy task. It requires a daily transformation of our character. To humble myself means literally to find repair under the mighty hand of God. The question now to, would be, practically speaking, how to humble myself? 1 Peter 5.7 tells us, cast all your anxiety upon Him. How to do that? How do we cast all our anxieties? I would have loved to have Peter telling us, step by step, what we should do, because I didn't learn yet. <laughs> The term he used means literally throwing. Like when you are carrying a, a heavy load and so you cannot bear it anymore and you want to get rid of it. 
to cast it. So you know that God is a good, good catcher? So you can do not hesitate to do that. Peter here refers to Psalm 55, 22, which says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and He will sustain you. Like if uh, the support from God comes only when we are able to cast our burdens on Him. So in prayer, just as you ask God to cast all your sins in the deepest place of the sea, in the same way, ask Him to relieve you from your cares, your weights, your worries, your anxieties. God will take our sorrows upon Him to release us and rejuvenate us. He told us, as a promise in Matthew 11, 28, Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Let's humble ourselves. Let's place ourselves under God's mighty hand. Let's ask for God's intervention in our lives. Let Him, uh, let him act in our lives personal life. Now, I would like to invite Sonia to tell us a beautiful story. So I would like to call the kids' attention. Kids, are you here? I hope so. Now Sonia is going to tell you a beautiful story. And please be sure that your parents are attentive to the story, okay? <laughs> Once there was a king who feared that his armies would lose battles. He fretted that his treasury would one day be empty. He suspected that his ministers were disloyal. He had no peace. One day the king wondered, how do common people find happiness? Do they worry as much as I do? Suddenly he had an idea. He removed his crown and dressed himself in ragged clothes. The disguised king walked through all his kingdom through the day, observing the ways of common people. At nightfall, he passed a little house at the edge of the city. Peeking through the window, the king saw a man sitting at a crude wooden table, eating a simple loaf of bread, but looking happy. He wondered, how is this poor man so happy? The king knocked at the door, I'm a poor beggar, he said in his humblest voice. Can you give me some food? Certainly, said the poor man. A guest is always welcome in this house. I do not have much, but all I have is yours. The poor man piously blessed and cut the bread. The king accepted his share and watched the man chew his bread as if it were the finest meal. Why are you so happy, he asked. The poor man replied, it was a good day. I'm a cobbler who repairs old shoes. Today I fixed enough shoes to buy this loaf of bread. But what if tomorrow you do not earn your bread, the king inquired. The poor man smiled and said, day by day I have faith. All will be well. The king thought to himself, this man's faith brings him happiness. I wonder how happy he would be in times of difficulty. So he decided to test the man's faith. The next morning when the man went out to work, he discovered the king had issued a new law. It is henceforth illegal for anyone to repair shoes. The poor man noticed several men carrying wood from the forest. He approached a woodcutter and asked if he needed an assistant. Certainly was the reply. And the poor man spent all day cutting wood. By nightfall, he had earned enough money to buy bread, milk, and cheese for his dinner. When the king again, dressed as a beggar, arrived at the cottage, the poor man invited him in to come inside. To the king's surprise, the poor man shared an even finer meal. How did you own your keep today? inquired the king. I'm a woodcutter now. As I told you, I have faith. As you can see, things are getting better day by day. The king grumbled, I must be far more clever. Surely when he cannot buy food, his faith will waver. The next day, when the poor man went to join the other woodcutters, 
he found them surrounded by palace soldiers. The captain loudly announced, the king has commanded that all woodcutters must go to the palace gate to become guards. The captain took the poor man with the rest. Now, dressed in a uniform with a sharp sword in a sheath at his side, he stood guard at the palace gate. As the sun set, he went to the captain of the soldiers to request some pay so he could buy himself his evening dinner. Palace guards are paid once a month, the captain replied. With a sigh, the poor man set out for home. As he passed the pound shop, an idea came to him. He sold the metal blade of the sword for enough money to buy food for a month. I will, buy back, I will buy back the sword in a month and return it to its rightful place. The poor man rushed home and set the table with a fine dinner. Before he ate, however, he busied himself carving a wooden blade to fill the now empty sheath he would wear at his side the next day. The king, once again disguised in rags, returned to the cottage and saw the food on the table. How did you buy this food? He asked in amazement. The poor man explained, I sold the metal blade of the sword for enough money to buy food for a month. Never suspecting that the beggar who stood in front of him was in fact the king, the poor man showed the wooden blade he was carving. This will replace the blade I sold until I have enough money to buy it back. Well, that was not very clever of you, said the king. What if you must draw your sword tomorrow? Once again, the poor man replied, day by day I have faith, all will be well. I have him now, the king said. His faith will not be so strong in the dungeon. The next day, the poor man stood in his uniform once again, guarding the palace gate. The captain of the king's soldiers, followed by a noisy crowd, dragged a man accused of being a thief. The captain led the thief up to the poor man and gruffly said, the king has ordered you to cut off his head. The thief fell to his knees and begged for mercy. Please do not kill me. I have no food for my three children. The poor man stood tall in his uniform and calmly considered this awkward situation. He thought, if I pull out my sword to kill this man, I too will be beheaded. Everyone will see the royal blade is missing. So he prayed to God and reminded himself, all will be well. As a large crowd watched, he lifted his arms to heaven and cried, Blessed be the Most High. If this man is innocent, let the blade of my sword become to wood. <laughs> Dramatically, he drew his sword and thrust it high above his head. A gasp went around the crowd. It's a miracle, people exclaimed. <laughs> Immediately, the man accused of theft was set free. At that moment, out of the crowd stepped the king. He approached the poor man and said, Do you recognize me? You are the king? Yes, but I'm also the beggar whom you fed last every night. The poor man's face spread with a smile, and this king smiled in return and said, Tonight and every night, my friend, you will dine with me. Your light of faith can help me chase away my darkest fears of the future. And so it came to pass that the poor man who was rich in faith became the wise advisor of the king. When things don't go the way we thought, do not worry. Day after day, you will have faith, and everything will go well for you. Why? How do I know that? I know that because the test says it. Because he cares for you. Peter here makes a play on words. The term to care literally means to worry, to distress. So he says, do not worry because you need just to cast all your worries, your anxieties upon him. 
Because he distresses, he cares, he worries for you. Peter affirms very strongly that God himself will take care of us and our families personally. God loves us so deeply and manifested that so many times that even when we have betrayed him, we found him to our side, by our side. God cares for us also when things do not go the way we hoped for. To humble oneself means also to be able to accept that the burden you are presenting to God in prayer does not go the way you hoped for. Not all the stories end well on this earth. In July 2021, both my parents got COVID. Both were hospitalized. After three weeks of intense prayers with my sister and, sister and the rest of my family, my mom survived, but my dad lost his life. Reading this text of 1 Peter, I tried to cast my burden on God. Although the suffering is still there for the great loss, the peace of God reached me and reached my mother and my sister and the family since the very day, the very first day of my father's hospitalization. In spite of the humiliation my father experienced through sickness and death, I know that in due time, God will lift him up. Thus, when we face difficulties and are afraid, God tells us, do not fear, because I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 41.10 When we walk in the valley of of the shadow of death, David says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Psalm 23.4 When we are suffering from a thorn in the flesh, the Lord says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weaknesses. 2 Corinthians 12.9 Dear brothers and sisters, dear friends, dear PMC family, do not fear, for God loves us so much that He cares for us personally, according to our everyday need. Let's keep the peace of the Lord in our hearts, so that whatever happens, and I repeat that, whatever happens, we can have faith and peace in God. Since He cares for us, let's humble ourselves under God's mighty hand that He may lift us up in due time. May God bless each one of you. Amen.